We are pleased to be able to welcome back to our show this week a man who has long been a great friend of the University of Notre Dame and currently teaches a class with Jack Swarbrick in the Mendoza College of Business. Ken Shanzer began his career at NBC Sports in 1981 as Vice President, Talent and Program Negotiations. He then spent the majority of his career with NBC before retiring as President of NBC Sports in 2011, a position he held for 13 years. Ken Shanzer is the man responsible for NBC's landmark agreement for the exclusive network television rights for Notre Dame football home games, a now 25-year agreement that has provided more than $100 million in scholarship aid to Notre Dame students. He also played a key role in negotiating NBC's deal with the NFL for the network to become the home of the premier primetime football television package, Sunday Night Football. This is Ken's second appearance on the show this fall, in part because there was just not enough time to cover all the topics we wanted to the first time he visited with us back in September. You know, it, 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 it only seemed like three years ago you were on the show. Yeah. September? It, it, God, it's taken a long time this season. <laughs> <laughs> we were celebrating then the, uh, the $100 million threshold from the uh, broadcast agreement yep. with, uh, between Notre Dame and, and NBC. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's quite a legacy from, from that, that event in your career. When you look back on the partnership, what what are all the what are the things that make you proud of it, but so wedded to it? So why, why is why is it such a part of Ken Shanzer? Um, you know, I, I I I spoke this morning to the athletic staff, and um, and during the talk, I, I mentioned the fact that I left. I was from, with NBC from 1981 until 2011 when I retired, and except for two and a half years in the mid 90s during which I left to go run something called the Baseball Network. And I mentioned to your staff today that, that while I was gone from NBC running the Baseball Network, which was a terrific job with a terrific group of people, the single thing that I missed most was my association with the university. And I, I mean, as I said to the, the group, this relationship has informed the entirety of my adult life. Now, now a piece of it derives from the following, that um, I, as, as you get older, you worry about your obituary. Um, and were it not for my relationship with Notre Dame, there's a decent chance that my obituary would be headlined by the XFL. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not true. Uh, but. I, there's there's a there's a, a thirty for thirty that's going to be uh, um, that's going to begin airing the week of the Super Bowl on the XFL. It's called This Is the XFL, it, and it's remarkable. It's an, it's a really an incredible film. Um, but I'm, I, I, I got to have Notre Dame as prominent as I can in, uh, in reports of, uh, <laughs> of my demise. Um, it's, this is the point at which you're supposed to say, well, we hope that demise isn't soon. Of course, we've had a version of this conversation we have had before. You should share it with the audience. We have had precisely this version. And, and, it, and it goes actually to the heart of your question because uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, we lost a friend of mine uh, far too early. He was 50 years old. And so on the far side of that, my wife and I were talking about, um, about final arrangements. Um, and my wife is, is 15 years younger than I am. And so when we talk about final arrangements, it's always my final arrangements. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, but anyway, so we're talking about my final arrangements. And I think I may have mentioned the last time I was on the, uh, the show that, that um, when my youngest was, uh, was accepted at Notre Dame, the university called me to tell me that he, was, he was, had been accepted. And so I would have three on campus at one time. And, and I said to Lou Nani, who called me to tell me that, that Peter had been accepted, well, will I be the parent with the most children on campus? And, and Lou said, uh, well, no, we have a lot of big families. And I said, well, I guarantee this, I'm going to have the most Jewish kids on campus. Anyway, so I'm saying to my wife, you know, here's, you know, here's where I'd like to, I think I'd like to be buried, which is probably in Vail, Colorado, where I live. And I said, but, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about the funeral itself. Um, I, I, here's what I'm thinking. And, and I called Jack, I called you the next week, and I said, I repeated this conversation, and I said, now, I don't know if this is humanly possible, but what I said to my wife is, I would like Father Jenkins to officiate at my funeral, notwithstanding that I'm Jewish. And you responded without hesitation, I'm sure he'd love to. And I said to you, could you first say we hope it isn't soon? <laughs> so anyway, so it doesn't end there. So about six months later, I end up talking to Father Jenkins, and he graciously agreed to do this. 
um, notwithstanding my faith. And uh, about a month or so later, my daughter was walking on campus and she saw Father Jenkins. And Father said, uh, hey, Lindsay, how are you? She, he said, you know, I'm really looking forward to your father's funeral. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we all have the same approach to this event. Clearly. But, but understand, going back to the, 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 the genesis of this story, it's, it, it just kind of underscores the fact that, you know, this university has been an essential part of my, of my life and my, my, my adult life. Um, so it's not just that I, I, I want them there at my the final moment. I, you know, I, I've always believed that since I made this deal, uh, and since actually before I made the deal, this is a very, very special place. Um, and, and over the years when I was asked, uh, I guess it's probably appropriate now as well, when I was asked in, in bad football seasons, you know, do, are you still in favor of the deal? And I'd say, but without hesitation, we're, we're in, we're, we, we love this deal because we live in the reflected glory of, 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 of the nature of this program and of the nature of this institution, um, which, I mean, it always enhances our brand. So we live in the, reflect, in the reflection of Notre Dame's brand, um, which continues to this day, um, notwithstanding some things that have happened. It, 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 main, it, it is still... The, the gold standard, no pun intended, in, in universities in America. Um, and, and to be a part of it and to be as welcomed here and to be as treated as warmly as I've been over the years has been an absolute, absolutely critical piece of my life. Well, and, and, and reflected currently with the, uh, the extraordinary compensation we extend to you for yeah. agreeing to be my, uh, my, my, my co-professor in, in But, you in know, but in, in fairness, and I, I think I need to say this, Notre Dame, does, Notre Dame does things in proportion. Their view of my worth <laughs> is reflected <laughs> clearly in what, they, in what they pay me as an adjunct professor. Um, adjunct, of course, meaning the same thing in every language, which is free um no it's it's i i respect the, the university I've, I've more listen i have more respect for the university deciding not to pay me than i would if they paid me too much so, um, <laughs> and as i always point out in this conversation you and i get paid the same amount to teach this for, class, the teaching, so. yes. for the teaching for the teaching right, yeah, as, exactly as, I'm, as, as, I'm i'm retired so i don't i'm not eligible for anything else i got it what have you learned about ken shanzer by teaching the class Oh boy, um, that's a great question. Um, well, the first thing I've learned is how old I am. Uh, it is it's absolutely striking to to stand in front of a group of young people, intelligent young people, and discuss instances and in, in, in pieces of your life when in, in involving relatively famous people, and. Learning the discipline of, of having to ask the class as you tell the story whether they have any idea about whom you're speaking. And almost without fail, they don't. This morning, I, I appeared before your staff, um, and I, I was telling a story about the NCAA basketball championship and the fact that when I had come to NBC in 1981, I, I assigned to myself task of getting the NCAA basketball championship back on NBC. And I looked at your staff and I said, does anybody here realize that the NCAA basketball championship was on NBC? And there wasn't a person in the room who did. Now, it's fair to say that NBC made, they were the ones who created the Final Four as a, as a national institution. They had a remarkable group of announcers, uh, Dick Enberg, Billy Packer, and uh, Al McGuire, who, who broadcast it, were, were universally acclaimed. And when, they, when NBC lost it, it was a big deal. Uh, I'm not here to argue that, that CBS hasn't done an incredible job with it. it, it it's great for college basketball that, and, and that, that CBS has it. But the, your, this group of, of, of intelligent, connected people had no idea. Derivatively, uh, for people my age, ABC was the, uh, the Olympic network because right. they did every Olympics, with the exception of 1972, from 1960 until 1988, um, and the exception of 72 in Tokyo and, and 80 in, in Moscow, which, in which we didn't participate. But, um, but for people nowadays, NBC is and has been the Olympic network for the entirety of their lives. So 
I, the discipline of of making certain that that people have a point of reference when I'm telling them a story. And that's, by the way, a great discipline in communication generally, that, that you, you can't afford, and it's one of the things that's been underscored in this, that when you're communicating with people, you cannot afford to assume that they know anything. It's not to say that they're not smart. They simply may not have learned whatever it is that forms the seedbed of the thing you're trying to, dis- to discuss. And so, so that's one of the things I've learned. Um, um, two is... Uh, um, you know, this is a remarkable generation of, of kids, um, but they are at a very, very different place than we were. And so the change is, is manifest, the, and, and, the, and, and the pace of change in, in society and in young people, I guess we call them millennials, is, is a pace and manifest. Um, and the, the, the repercussions of that are very, very difficult to, to assess for the moment. It, so it's a, it, it, what, what screams back at me at the end of every year, other than why am I doing this, or why, or, 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 or better yet, why are they listening to you? Um, but anyway, but the thing that, that screams back at me is, is how fleeting whatever we're saying to them is, and that how, so how the, so that the, that the lessons that are eternal are more important than the lessons that are that are present and substantial. So, for example, you know, you, you and I teach three life skills, they being presentation skills, negotiating skills, and management skills. Those skills don't change. They're enduring. And, and my hope is, and we kind of backed into doing that, my hope is that when these kids leave here, that they'll, they're not going to necessarily remember the stuff we told them about what, what the media marketplace looks like. But hopefully those, those skill sets are going to, going to have been improved by what we've done. And then we'll walk out having made a contribution to a significant number of young, spe- young people's lives. That's the hope. Who knows? And you're well, better at it than I am anyway. Oh, so. not true. Oh, yeah. One of, one of the things that I think for both of us makes the class so fun is we are, we are teaching on a topic. You know, it must be like te- teaching physics, right? It's changing every day. Absolutely. And, and for us... Uh, analyzing and helping young people understand sort of the media dynamic and the, and all the ramifications of it in our society today is pretty is pretty fun to do. In the sports media world, one of the big topics this year is revolved around NFL ratings. Yeah. You know all of that as well as anybody in the world. When you look at it at this point in the season, there's certainly been some rebound in it. But what 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 are your observations? What do you take away from what happened this year? Well, it's. It's something that I've, for which I've been waiting, like waiting for Godot, for a long time. Um, this, if this is real, and we don't know whether or not what's happening this year is, is the beginning of, of, a, of a trend that's going to be here um, or not. But if it is, and I, and I tend to think it is. Um, it's it's something that, as I say, we've been awaiting for a while. And I, in my heart of hearts, I, I think it is it's a function of the overexposure of the NFL. Um, the simplest elements of them of it, and the things to which most people refer, are, are their, their the number of weekly exposures. So that you know they, they were initially a Sunday afternoon package um, with Saturday afternoons late in the in post December post fo- high school and college football. Um, but they were principally a Saturday afternoon package. Then they went to Sunday night, uh, Monday night. Then they added Sunday night. Now they've added Thursday. Then on top of that, they've added some morning games in London, and 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 that's another you know another exposure. We used to call the time period within which any game appeared an exposure. So the 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 early window on Sunday on Fox with se- with several games was one exposure and the late afternoon, which might have one or two games, is another exposure. So, so there are now, on, sun, on some Sundays, there are four exposures, actually some five, but you have an early morning one from London, then two in the, on one network, one on the other, and one at night. That's five exposures. Then you have Sunday, uh, Monday night is six, Thursday seven. Okay, so you've had a lot of, you've had a, 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 an explosion of exposure, and, and with the explosion of exposure, by, of exposures, by definition, you diminish the amount of available product in each of the exposures. So Monday, uh, Sunday, Sunday night, Monday night, and Thursday are single exposures, but the rest of them have to be filled by the remaining games. 
So you're starting to dissipate the impact of the property of the product, and the product is only so deep. So that's that's another element. And then finally, and this is the thing that I think just does it. You have this proliferation of pro, of 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 programming and chatter that's incessant. It, it incessant meaning it never stops, and it and it ranges from fantasy and all of its. Right. All of its its uh, um, tributaries to talk radio to to Sports Center and 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 all the stuff that that goes on in Fox Sports and ESPN, and by the end of it, you're just this this, this relentless, constant drumbeat of discussion about something, and and we will have gone from a point at which a product was relatively exclusive. To, the, to it being everywhere. And when it is everywhere, it starts to lose its, its impact. It's, it starts to lose its resonance. Um, you know, in my lifetime, when I, was, when I was young, there was a football game, a college football game on. On the Monday after Leather that, helmets, right? Well, no helmets. <laughs> Leather teeth. <laughs> anyway. But no, there was, you know, so Nebraska would play Oklahoma in, Right. Big game there, and everybody in America would would gather on Monday and talk about that game. There were what a hundred games on on the air on Saturday. Now they're, they're everywhere, and and the NFL was very fortunate in that for a long time they held their product very tightly. Mm-hmm. They held it to three Sunday afternoon windows and a Monday night window, and now it's just everywhere. So I'm, if I'm the NFL, I worry that I'm losing this, a, a, a piece, not all of it, because they're still the dominant sport by a lot, but that they're losing some of their specialness. And when that slips, it's very difficult to put the fire back in the box. Let me just go on to some, something peripheral to this, which, is, which I believe as well, and we're seeing today. Quite some years ago, George Steinbrenner created the Yes Network to to sell or to control his baseball rights. Right. And in New York City, Cablevision was the dominant cable player. So Steinbrenner made a whole series of carriage deals with with um, cable systems around New York City, but Cablevision would not make a deal with him. And all the other Cable systems were sitting there waiting for cable, cable Vision's deal because they all had deals that had a most favored nations clause. So if Cable Vision could drive the price down low enough, they would all derive benefit. Well, Cable Vision hung out. They, they were not going to pay. They were not going to pay what Steinbrenner was insisting. And they went into the baseball season. There were 3 million Cable Vision subscribers. And George Steinbrenner was sure that New York Yankee baseball was of such such t- uh, um, uh, importance to, to, to the viewers of Cablevision that he would be able to de- demand whatever he got. Cablevision held out. By the end of or three quarters of the season, some 30,000 out of 3 million subscribers had, had gone from Cablevision to DirecTV, which had made a deal with Steinbrenner. And Cablevision would have ended up driving a deal at a much lower price had not the politicians gotten into it and forced Cablevision under threat of some regulatory sanctions to make a deal with Steinbrenner. But what it told me, that whole incident told me the following, that the adhesion between the sports fan and his product is a lot more attenuated than people think it is. And that if you either take it away from them or force them to pay too much for it, they'll simply walk away. And I think the NFL has to be very, very, very careful about how they approach their fan base and how, how they, they, they deal with this phenomenon, lest they really undermine the, 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 the adhesion between their fan. I mean, we're seeing in Los Angeles this occurring with the Dodgers. Absolutely. I mean, it, so it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. We, I think we take for granted the, uh, the intensity and need of, of people for sports or for their teams. There's no doubt that at the core there's a group for whom they're essential to their lives. But the more you get to the periphery, the less important it becomes. Um, anyway, I don't know if that's, that's a very long answer, but it, it's a, 
I would I would be worried if I were the NFL. I yeah. think I think there's an issue. That's that's fascinating insight. We got to wrap it up, but I want to tell you I was in New York this week for a college football week, and I had uh, drinks with somebody who has had a business relationship with the NFL for three decades, and I told him your deli story, and he laughed so hard. Do you want me to tell him? Yeah, and finally he said. Can I use this? And I said, well, I'll check with Ken Shanzer because he's the owner of this story. But uh, okay. give, give gonna, your perspective but I need to, I real know, quick. I need to tell, okay, I got to do, I'm going to tell you two stories, though. The, the, so the, when I first started coming out here, this is about stories. When I first started coming out here, Gene Cargan was the athletic director, and I'm at his house on a Thursday, and he says, Shanzer, you know what you're going to do tomorrow? I said, what? He says, you're going to speak to the quarterback club. I, what? Yeah, you're going to speak. I had no idea. I, I, never, I, I So I go to the quarterback club. It's like 1,200 people, and I'm getting up to speak, and I'm seated next to Lou Holtz. And Holtz kind of won't give me the time of day. And then I get up and speak. And during the speech, I quoted Grant Tinker, who died this week. Yeah. And, and I quoted him about NBC and, and what Grant had said about NBC and its programming. We were mired in last place. He said, first will be best, then we'll be first. And Lou, I sat down. Lou Holtz says to me, the single greatest compliment Lou Holtz can give you, which is, you know, kid, you can handle a microphone. <laughs> and then he said that first will be best and then we'll be first. I'll be using that. <laughs> anyway, so, so the story about the NFL is in describing dealing with the NFL, they're very, very, very difficult. Um, very difficult. And, and because they can, I guess, because they can afford to be. But I, I would tell them, make the observation when I was in discussions with him and we would be trying to make a deal. I'd look at their counsel and I'd say, you know, Frank, every time I deal with you, I have the following mental image. It's, it's you in a white smock standing behind a deli counter. And in front of you is the salami of NFL rights, which is in the slicing machine. And the slicing machine is set to one micron. And you're about to give me the smallest amount of rights you can for the <laughs> biggest amount of money. And that is how I define the way you deal with the NFL. Anyway, as always, a pleasure. Ken, always a treat. Thank you very much. Thanks for, uh, thanks for all you've done for this university and continue to do. Um, I'm jealous you get to celebrate the holiday twice, but uh, happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. This year, same day. Same day this year. December 24th is Hanukkah. Wow. I never celebrate Hanukkah. I'm, I celebrate Christmas with a vengeance because as a kid, my parents celebrated Hanukkah and I, I kept looking at the Christmas kids having all the fun. We, we celebrated mightily. Anyway, Mer- thanks for Merry having Christmas. me. Merry Christmas. Thanks for being on. You're we'll be joking. back in a minute. Think about there and to be able to lace up and play the game that I love was something that I've always dreamed about. It's a blessing. I just get goosebumps sometimes. You look up and you just see, you know, thousands of people in the stand cheering you on. Playing for my brothers, man. It's time to show it now. Everybody's looking. Defense!